Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Brent Glass, um, the co-founder of the National History Academy and director emeritus of the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program. The National History Academy is a history education and civic engagement program uh, offered to high school and to middle school students from across the United States and in other countries around the world. Uh, we're very pleased this uh, summer that there are students from 42 states, uh, four territories and 18 foreign countries who, have, uh, part who are participating in the National History Academy this, this summer. In 2018 and 2019, we offered the program as a five week residential program for high school students. And of course, this summer, because of the COVID pandemic, we are now uh, offering the program as an online program for high school and for middle school students. Uh, the program this summer is a four week program, which started last week on July 6th and will run through the end of this month. The program consists of three parts of visits, virtual visits to historic sites and landmarks across the United States that illustrate important themes in American history. Second part are classroom activities led by master teachers for the high school and middle school program. And the third part is a series of uh, guest speakers uh, who are leaders in uh, teaching American history, preserving American history, and um, promoting uh, the study of American history. And this series uh, began last week with a, uh, a presentation by Ed O'Keefe, who is the chief executive officer at the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Presidential Library Foundation in North Dakota. He spoke about Theodore Roosevelt uh, to a number of uh, appreciative uh, students and also uh, to our followers on, uh, on Facebook. Um, and now tonight uh, you will meet uh, a very special speaker uh, who is the acting director of the National Park Service, David Bela. Um, and I know that you will enjoy his presentation. We are still enrolling students. Uh, tuition is free. So I encourage you to go to our website, National History Academy org and enroll in the remaining sessions uh, for this summer and then follow us uh, throughout the year when we continue to offer programs through the National History Academy. Now I'm pleased to introduce Bill Sellers who is the president of the National History Academy uh, who will introduce our speaker. Yeah, well thank you so much Brent and we are incredibly privileged to have you as uh, as part of the program, but uh, but we're, we're it's a it's a, an unbelievable privilege to have David Bella here tonight. He is the deputy director exercising the authority of director for the National Park Service, which is a is a long title, but he's he's running the National Park Service right now. Um, in that position, he's in charge of administering 419 different national park units, over 20,000 employees who. Uh, who run our national parks to uh, promote recreation, conservation, preservation, and telling stories of our nation's history. Uh, the budget of National Park Service exceeds $3 billion. Uh, David grew up in a small town about an hour outside of Houston, uh, graduated from Texas A&M with a BS degree in rec recreation and parks. He actually joined National Park Service as a college student in 1981 and has spent the majority of his career there. He's been superintendent of the Palo Alto Battlefield National Historic Site, the Lyndon B. Johnson National Historic Park, George Washington Memorial Parkway, uh, Grand Teton National Park, and the John D. Rockefeller Memorial Parkway. And of particular interest to me, um, uh, we run National History Academy through the Journey Through Hallowed Ground National Heritage Area. We're one of 49 national heritage areas throughout the United States. Uh, the journey uh, runs from Gettysburg uh, to Charlottesville. We have 12 national parks, uh, over 200 sites related to civil rights, uh, Main Street communities, uh, uh, history going back to the to the, the very start of the start of the United States to the colonial period to the pre-colonial period. So, um, uh, you know, uh, from um, 
2008 to 2012, David served as the NPS Southeast Regional Director and oversaw a number of national heritage areas there. Uh, he's the recipient of numerous awards, both inside and outside of National Park Service, and uh, I'm very pleased to present David, Be David Bella. Oh, thank you, Brent, and thank you, Bill. I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, and thank you, students, uh, as well. Um, what I'd like to do is to kind of give you a little perspective of how I wound up here in this office in Washington, D.C., the office of the director of the National Park Service. And it started on a uh, trip that my parents and uh, my two siblings and I took to Yellowstone National Park uh, in the late 60s, early 1970s. And uh, I, I remember um, that trip quite well because when we got to the first park was Grand Teton National Park. Uh, there weren't any visitors that looked like us as Latinos. And there weren't any park rangers that looked like us either. And when we found out that there were grizzly bears in the park, uh, we got a little scared. And, uh, but quickly realized that um, these are great places to experience. And as Latinos, that this, these parks were part of our, na our national birthright. And who would have thought that many decades later that I would serve as the 21st superintendent of that very first national park that changed my life at Grand Teton National Park. One of the things I remember vividly about that experience also was seeing that iconic green and gray uniform that shiny gold badge and that funny looking Stetson hat uh, that Rangers were wearing. And I remember thinking about as a teenager, right around your age, wow, what an amazing experience to live and work in a place like Grand Teton National Park. And not only did I have a chance to do that, but my wife and I, my kindergarten classmate and high school sweetheart, and bride of 40 years, wound up living in the superintendent's residence at Grand Teton National Park. All it took was one experience, and it changed my life in a national park. Um, and it was, it, was, it was quite compelling, because then I knew what I needed to, to do when I got back to Texas after talking with rangers. We eventually did make it to Yellowstone. And getting a sense, I was still in high school, of what, it, what I needed to study and the types of experiences that I needed. And I began that journey working in the Youth Conservation Corps. And Brent and Bill will remember, as I finally uh, do, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps that was created by President Franklin Roosevelt to get people to work in public places. And many of the roads and many of the overlooks that you see today in, Blue, in the Blue Ridge Parkway and in Shenandoah and Great Smoky Mountains were built by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Well, the Youth Conservation Corps came in later, much later in the 1970s, and that's how I began gaining experience working in a wildlife refuge and then working uh, while in high school and then college at a US Forest Service property, and then landed my first seasonal ranger job in Florida at age 19. So once I knew what I wanted to do, I began again uh, that journey, which provided so many enriching experiences that enabled me to be sitting today uh, in the director's chair as acting director. I'll share with you some experiences because most of my my journey in the Park Service what, what, is what we called affectionately the Cannonball Circuit, which are historical and cultural parks. So the first park that I worked at, you can see behind me, uh, was San Antonio Missions National Historical Park. And it contained four Spanish colonial missions. And I didn't really know much about my Latino heritage uh, until I landed as a rookie park ranger there in San Antonio and eventually ran 
that mission, which was the largest of the four. In fact, there were actually five missions, and one of them was uh, Mission San Antonio de Valero, today known as the Alamo. And the Alamo today only has the remnants of the church, but it was a very huge compound of structures and activity. But because a lot of it was uh, lost over time, it's not part of the National Park Service, but a lot of people think that it is. But the other four Spanish colonial missions are. What a great learning experience for me as a rookie park ranger, and frankly, the only uh, member of the original staff that's still working in the Park Service uh, today uh, from that uh, experience in San Antonio. So from there, uh, I took on the job as, because I wanted to go into law enforcement at Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park. And many of you know what happened at Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, I was the chief ranger. I went to uh, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy in Georgia and uh, had a great experience. I lived in the home of the district clerk, Mr. Pierce. It's a two-story house in the village of Appomattox Courthouse. Now, you will know this as students of history, but I didn't when I first pulled up with my, uh, my wife and our two-year-old child. I was expecting to go into Appomattox and seeing a courthouse and seeing a, a table with two chairs in the courthouse. Well, that courthouse existed. But back in the day, and, and Bill uh, uh, from Virginia knows this very well, that there was a tradition of naming the towns after the courthouse. So the town of Gifford Courthouse, the, the village of Appomattox Courthouse. The surrender, as you know, took place in the McLean House. And that's a fascinating story onto itself. So I had a chance to learn in my first sight Spanish colonial history, then Civil War history, and would actually sit in the parlor of the McLean House where Lee surrendered to Grant. And I remember as I closed the village at the end of the night with my uh, daughter, I'd take her on patrol with me and we'd lock up the houses and uh, I'd have her sit in the parlor where Lee and Grant sat. And she remembered as she started studying Civil War history in, in high school, that experience. And it was a phenomenal experience. From there, we went on to Philadelphia at Independence National Historical Park, where I was a district ranger. The park was divided up into four districts, and I had 40 park rangers that worked for me. Uh, and I would manage the first bank of the United States, the very first bank of the United States, the smallest unit in the Park Service, that is the Zuzko National Memorial, uh, who was a Revolutionary War hero of Polish descent. Uh, Read his story. His story is fascinating, in addition to some other historic properties. But to have the chance to walk along those cobblestone streets that George Washington walked, and Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton, and, 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 and our founding fathers and, and founding ladies, uh, was quite an experience in Philadelphia. Then I had a 10-year absence with the Park Service, where I worked as a a federal agent in New York City doing white collar criminal investigations. I eventually moved back to Texas and worked for a, uh, a, a member of, of Congress who was a committee chairman who died tragically in a plane crash. Uh, went to work for the Texas Attorney General uh, running one of his, uh, one of his agencies uh, in Texas. And then I came back to the Park Service in 1998. Uh, in this case, managing as the third superintendent of the only U.S.-Mexican war property in the national park system at Palo Alto uh, Battlefield. At that time, it was a national historic site. Today, it's a national historical park. Uh, quite the experience. I was there for close to five years. And then I went to uh, work at Lyndon B. Johnson National Historical Park, running uh, President Johnson's ranch uh, and, the te and the famed Texas White House while Lady Bird Johnson uh, was still alive. And I wish we had the time for me. Uh, my camera cr can't quite reach the picture that she signed for me in 2006 that uh, has been with me everywhere I've gone. Uh, just phenomenal memories of 
uh, being the first Latino superintendent uh, of President Johnson's ranch and working with Lady Bird and working with the president's daughters, Lucy Johnson and Linda Robb, uh, was a fascinating experience. And one of the things that was so meaningful to me, and I remember the first visit that we had with Lady Bird uh, at the ranch was, uh, I shared with her that the Great Society is one of President Johnson's hallmark pieces of legislation. And it had a number of components. One was Head Start. Head Start is exactly that. It gives you young kids a head start before pre-K and kindergarten especially for those parents that couldn't pay for that. Uh, I was a graduate of Head Start. In the 1970s, when my dad was getting his master's degree, uh, times, times were tough financially. And uh, so we were on the food stamp program, another one of his initiatives. Uh, and clearly affirmative action of me being the first Latino to run Linda B. Johnson National Historical Park. So I, I remember having this conversation with Mrs. Johnson and I remember saying that I'm one of the many hundreds of thousands of living legacies of the Great Society program. And I can tell you it was quite an emotional experience for both of us that I will never forget, including the private dinners with Mrs. Johnson and my wife uh, in the Texas White House. Um, I could spend hours talking about that. From there, uh, came to the nation's capital in Virginia to run the uh, George Washington Memorial Parkway. Uh, then I became the regional director in Atlanta for the Southeast region. I had 66 national parks uh, in the Southeast and in the Caribbean. Uh, then I uh, was asked to come back to Washington to start a new directorate on workforce relevance and inclusion. Uh, did that, wanted to go back to the field uh, at uh, Grand Teton National Park. And then I got a call from the secretary, Secretary Zinke, at that time to come up and have a meeting with him where I was then recommended and was nominated by the President of the United States to be the 19th Director of the National Park Service. Went through my confirmation hearings in the Senate, came out with a year, near unanimous vote, which I'm deeply humbled by, uh, only for that Congress to sine die, which means that the Senate terminated its business, uh, which left hundreds of nominees uh, not confirmed. So you have to begin that process all over again with the new Congress being renominated by the president and going back through the confirmation process. But the Secretary of the Interior decided by secretarial order uh, on October 1st, 2019, to make me the de facto acting director of the National Park Service. Uh, I have two, we have two children uh, that are also graduates of Texas A&M University. Uh, our son played football at A&M with Vaughn Miller and Ryan Tannehill. And he's following in his old man's footsteps as a chief ranger in one of our units in Florida. Our daughter's in the education field and we have six grandkids. So Bill, I think that pretty much captures 38 years of public service. Well, that's, that, that is quite something. <laughs> I'd be happy to sure. begin the Q&A or, or answer any questions that you and, uh, and Brent may have. Sure, we already have about 100 questions in the <laughs> chat. So for those who are following along on Facebook, all of our students are uh, very interested in, in what Mr. Vela has to say. So why don't we start off with a question from Shannon. Uh, how do you and your staff go about interpreting and presenting history that may be seen as controversial to some visitors, i.e. slavery and civil war at battlefields? Yes, and, and, uh, and clearly the nation, that's a very good question, uh, is, is struggling with that. You know, I remember as a kid in the, in the 60s growing up, uh, and I use this example when I'm asked, David, what's your position on removing Confederate statues or, or statues in general? Uh, the position of the National Park Service when we have those statues and memorials on federal property, not outside of parks, but on federal property, is that they tell a story. And I'm gonna share a personal one real quick. And I think hopefully it'll put things in perspective. Growing up in the late six, in the 60s and early 70s, my wife and I went to kindergarten together and we'd go to a local movie theater. And they would uh, put the colored kids 
and the Mexican kids up in the balcony. And I remember the first thought was, okay, hey, we got a good seat, we're in the balcony. Not knowing that there was a reason why they were putting us up in the balcony because that movie theater was segregated. That movie theater still exists in my hometown. And I have six grandkids from age 14 to age three that are a mixed heritage. I can take my grandkids into that movie theater, point to that balcony and say, that's where they call my wife Mimi. That's where Mimi and grandpa had to sit. And the first question that will be asked, why grandpa? I have an answer. So it is an important conversation to have. And if in, in, in the view of the Park Service, if you remove that from the federal footprint, you miss out that opportunity, just as I would if that theater were no longer there in my hometown. That is the position of the Park Service. But we also talk about and, 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 and protect places that were very challenging and difficult in our history. And they all provide teachable moments and opportunities. Uh, and that's a good thing. And, and, and we do that every day because these parks are, in, are established in perpetuity. Uh, so hopefully that gave you a personal perspective, but also an operational perspective of how we look at these types of issues in national park units. How have you perceived the change in uh, the significance of national parks throughout your career? I, I, I will tell you that from, from a workforce perspective, when, when I came in early on, uh, we were more diverse when I came in over 30 years ago as a workforce. You know, I shared San Antonio, 90% uh, of our staff are Latino. And it made sense. We were the first rangers to open up the park. Uh, you know, sadly, our uniforms, uh, not sadly, I mean, we're very proud of our federal partners, but sadly from the perspective of when we first put on those flat hats and went into those mission communities, they perceived that community, which are active parish communities, whose descendants uh, were there, perceived us as a US Border Patrol. And we're not, obviously we have a totally different function and mission. Uh, but as knowing the language and representing that culture, we were able to assimilate a lot faster into that community in San Antonio because we spoke the language and we're part of that culture. Uh, we have not improved to the point where we need to be uh, in the service, but we're working on it. Uh, one of my, my life's goal in the Park Service, which is why we created a directorate in Washington called uh, Workforce and Inclusion, is to not only tell the stories that haven't been told of our nation, but to make sure that our workforce reflects the face of our nation. And we have many, many youth programs that are available and hiring authorities to do that. So I own that narrative with this agency, because if we don't make ourselves relevant to the students on this phone call, on this chat, uh, and on Facebook, to the next generation, who's going to sit in these offices? Who's going to wear the green and gray of the National Park Service if they don't find themselves in these stories and don't find us relevant in their lives? It's extremely important. What is your number one priority for National Park Service? I have 20,000 employees in the National Park Service. And my number one priority is that every employee goes home safely. Every volunteer, every concession employee, uh, seasonal, it doesn't matter, goes home safely at the end of the day. Sadly, in my career, that hasn't always happened. Uh, and, and, and as part of that, because these are the, the proud, dedicated men and women that protect our nation's most special places and all the stories that they contain. So my first priority is to make sure that our workforce is that we, we address emotional wellness, that we, we address safety, 
uh, that we provide it, the, the resources that they need to effectively do their jobs. And in the course of doing that, they're protecting, they're serving, uh, they're doing the science, uh, they're reaching out to communities, uh, they're engaging the next generation, they're building technologies to help us in a second century National Park Service. For me, it starts with our workforce. They are truly the pride of the National Park Service. Those last two, I meant to say the names of all the, the students asking questions. The last two were from Palin and, and Evan. Uh, this is from Giovanna. Uh, what is the relationship between national parks and non-renewable fuel companies? Um, we do have national parks and preserves uh, that have, through their legislation, uh, gas, oil and gas interest. Uh, Big Thicket National Park and Preserve. We have some seashores, uh, Padre Island National Seashore where these activities were taking place prior to these areas becoming units of the National Park Service. Um, so it, it, it's not a, a very involved other than to uh, the folks that are involved in those activities, the companies. Um, we do try to, uh, I'll give an example. Uh, we work very closely with Subaru on a zero waste landfill initiative. Uh, and we had Yosemite, Grand Teton, the park that I was at, uh, and a couple other parks that were looking at how do we become more green, uh, more fuel efficient using uh, electric vehicles as an example. Uh, we have more contact, more relationship with that part of the community than we do from the extractive industry part because a lot of our parks don't have that. So that's just by, by the nature of the work that we do. Uh, but we are very much involved in and reducing carbon footprint in national parks by our, by our vehicle fleets, by our concession operations and what we dispose of, how we dispose, recycling. Uh, we wanna try to be as engaged as we can with those very important communities. Okay, uh, Saul Torres uh, asks, has, has funding been an issue? Um, we, we maximize, as to the best of our ability, every appropriate dollar we get from Congress. The reality is, is that we do everything we can to give the taxpayer a return on their investment. But we also, through our congressionally charted partner, the National Park Foundation, uh, leverage capacity within the philanthropic community. And boy, was I the recipient of, of that at Grand Teton National Park uh, through donors who give their time, their talents, and their, and their uh, financial assets to help us to achieve uh, our mission. Give an example. If you've been to Jenny Lake in Grand Teton National Park, a go-to destination, uh, the front country and the back country is spectacular. Well, over generations, uh, we had a lot of what we call deferred maintenance that we didn't have the budgets to get to. Uh, and so with our philanthropic partner, they raised over $15 million, which we leveraged with federal funds, go see it now. And it is an enriching experience. And there are many other examples. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein here, uh, here in the nation's capital, the Washington Monument, which was damaged severely by earthquake, provided his own personal assets to get the Washington Monument open. So uh, the president, uh, through what's called the Green Book, the budget process, submits our budget to Congress. Congress, over the last number of years, has uh, looked at the budget and has, uh, and, th and the good thing is the Park Service does have bipartisan support, and we're very fortunate. Uh, so they'll take the president's budget, and they can do a number of things with it. Uh, fortunately, they have increased the number of our fund sources. But again, uh, we also look at how can we leverage that with philanthropic support as well. Ann Miotti asks, uh, do you prefer the natural wildlife parks or historical sites, and why, and which is your favorite of each? That's a really good question. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, my first superintendency was at Palo Alto, right? I, the only U.S.-Mexican war property in the national park system. 
But the reason why it was fought at Palo Alto, and by the way, Ulysses S. Grant fought at Palo Alto. Many of the notables in the Civil War fought in the U.S.-Mexican War, Robert E. Lee uh, being one of them as well. And so they fought there primarily because of the natural terrain. They ha we have resacas, which are water, bodies of water. Uh, and, and United States forces successfully used the natural features of that battlefield to win the first battle of the U.S.-Mexican War. So what I've learned is, is that there's no such thing. Um, is that what is, per what is perceived as uh, a historical cultural park had some tremendous natural features and assets as well. Uh, and you can look at a natural park uh, like uh, Grand Teton, where we had 10,000 years of human footprint, 10,000 years from Native Americans. We had 24 federal tribes that we dealt with at, uh, at Grand Teton, 24. Uh, so from Native American to the, the French fur trappers, uh, to the to explorers, to the surveyors, uh, to the the dude ranchers, and when you look at that iconic landscape at Grand Teton with grizzly and moose and elk and buffalo, you don't stop to think about the human footprint. Yet it exists. So not dodging the question, but the reality is is that uh, you have both, and that's what makes them special. And if I had a personal one. I got 419 units <laughs> <laughs> that are near and dear to my heart. That's excellent. Uh, is there an area in the United States that uh, you believe should be granted national park status? Uh, that's a question from Gita Jolly. Yeah, you know, there, there's, uh, there are a couple ways that national parks create. By the way, uh, now that we have a uh, first state in Delaware, Delaware was the last remaining state that did not have a national park unit. It does now. So we have national park units, national sea, and they're all part of the system, national seashores, recreation areas, historic sites, uh, battlefields, et cetera, that make the Park Service family. Uh, we have them in every state and the U.S. territories. Uh, so there are two ways that a park uh, can be established. One is through the Antiquities Act as President Theodore Roosevelt did uh, to hold in the place Grand Canyon uh, National Monument, which then Congress later came and created Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, Grand Teton was a national monument uh, and a national park. So the President through the Antiquities Act taking existing federal property can make it a national monument, preserve and protect it. The other is through Congress, through an act of Congress. Normally it's through what's called a special resource study, which the, the Congress asked the Park Service to perform a study, an analysis of does this site have national significance, national integrity, a story that hasn't been told before and there are other tests uh, that we use. Uh, and so those are the two ways that, uh, that you can create a national park site within the national park system. Uh, Bryce Lynn asks, what is your take on the movements to do away with statues or certain historical monuments and how does the unrest affect your job as the director of the national parks? Uh, I'll start with as a person of color. Um, I, you know, I grew up uh, again, uh, you know, and uh, um, and remember the sting and the pain of not only what my parents, my grandparents went through, but what I went through as a young kid. And you don't forget that, right? So you have those personal reflections and, you know, my oldest four, is 14, he's a straight A student, a great athlete. His dad played football at Texas A&M. Uh, there's a theme here with Texas A&M, just to be clear. Uh, and uh, I had to have the conversation because he's mixed. He's half Latino and he's half African American, along with his mother and, and with his dad. That was tough. I would not have thought that all these years having experienced what I experienced, that I'd be having the same conversations my parents had with me going back to the 1960s. 
So it's personal for me. But at the same time, we have an opportunity to not change people's perspective. The role of interpretation and education in the National Park Service is when you come into a national park, we're going to tell you something that you may not know. Uh, and it may or may not change your way of thinking, and that's okay. If we can get you when you leave that park, whether it's San Antonio Missions or Castillo de San Marcos or, uh, or MLK's Boyhood Home or Selma and Montgomery, wanting to know more, we've done our jobs. Because it's not the position of the Park Service to try to change your mind on any issue. The position of the Park Service is to give you the tools and the information for you to make up your own mind and hopefully encourage further dialogue in your community, within your family, uh, and, and to do more research. You want to come back and learn some more and have a more in-depth conversation? We embrace that. So that, that's kind of what our thinking is on any issue. You mentioned uh, Bill Manzanar. Oh my gosh, what a, what a difficult story. Because people are still alive that lived it, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's a, it's a unique opportunity to still take advantage of that oral history and, and share that with current and future generations. That's the role of the National Park Service. Mackenzie and a few others have asked, uh, do you think that protecting wildlife and animals is just as important as protecting the land itself? Well, I, I think that they're both equally important. Um, if we don't protect the landscape, the wildlife will suffer, right? Uh, and so it is about habitat, uh, whether it's endangered species, threatened and endangered species, uh, or, the, or exotic species. I mean, we spend, it's not animals, but it's on the vegetation side, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars eradicating exotic plant species, which will crowd out the native grasses and food sources that bison, moose, elk, uh, and, and bear use as sustenance. So they're all interrelated. Uh, and, and so you can't have one without the other. Uh, and, and we spent a lot of time uh, clearly, uh, as, as we have a, a, a warming climate, uh, you know, we have to be sensitive to those impacts, not only on sea level rise, especially in our coastal parks, we're starting to see that now, uh, but also uh, in, uh, you know, having a drier season, having a wetter season. Uh, and I know in Grand Teton, we had the toughest winter months in the last three years I was there six straight months of snow. And I remember talking to the locals and that they've never experienced that before. Uh, so clearly there are a number of factors that impact the health of wildlife from exotic plant species to uh, having enough land mass to be able to support migration routes uh, to also the effects of a warming climate. They're all interrelated. Uh, Sophie asks, uh, do you have a favorite historical role model? Uh, uh, that's a really good question. You know, I, I'm learning a lot. Uh, and I just uh, was extremely impressed on a piece I saw in Ulysses S. Grant. Extremely impressed. Um, I, uh, I, I quote... Um, Theodore Roosevelt quite a bit. Um, you know, I, ha I have a personal connection with, with President Johnson, uh, his story, uh, his family. Uh, but I'll tell you, more than anybody, I'm the oldest of 11 grandchildren in my generation. My grandfather was a sharecropper. And, and for the students, uh, a sharecropper was one that you worked on somebody else's property uh, and you were able to keep some, but you were able also to more than likely live on that land, um, but you don't own it. And uh, he could, my grandparents couldn't read or write. In fact, my, my grandmother, when she would go to the grocery store, she would uh, draw a symbol, if it was hamburger meat, of, of horns for a cow, 
And that's how she knew what was in the white butcher paper. And Brent and Bill, I know what you, you know what I'm talking about on the on the butcher paper. Uh, but I never forgot what they told me as the oldest of the family. And that was my, my, my responsibility as the oldest. My parents reinforced this notion of pursuing causes greater than myself. My parents were my role models and I chose public service to do that. And I've been in public service for 38 years, hopefully honoring the wishes of my grandparents, but clearly my parents were in their early 80s. So for me, it's personal, it's, it's family. Excellent. Uh, Anjali asks, uh, what do you think about the California missions and how we're educating visitors on the treatment of Native Americans and their lives as we're reassessing history as a society? So I don't know specifically about that, but I can just speak in general terms as someone that has Native American heritage, is we have to tell the stories, the tough stories. Uh, they're painful, uh, but they're part of our nation's history. You know, we're gonna have, uh, Bill, an opportunity with the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 2026. The National Park Service is gonna be leading, one of the leaders in that effort. Can you imagine the stories that we're gonna be able to tell. Stories that haven't been told. We're not making it up, but of, of who was involved, why they were involved in, uh, in creating this country in the United States. We have the opportunity now in the 19th Amendment Women's Suffrage Movement, celebrating 100 years. We're telling those stories. 400 year commemoration of slavery. I was there at uh, Fort Monroe uh, with the, the, the descendants of the first slave born in what is today America, but during the British colonies, the descendants were actually at this event. Can you imagine being descendants of the first slave slaves brought into the British colonies in America? And that was fascinating, meeting them. Uh, the same thing with Native American history and story is an extremely difficult story. But again, it gets back, Bill, to the earlier point that I was making that we have to tell them they're painful and hopefully it will inspire more research, more understanding, uh, because they were very difficult. difficult. Uh, you know, the disease that Europeans brought over uh, into the Americas uh, and, and what it took to lose total cultures, total languages, uh, because of this forced assimilation, it's painful. But we have to tell them. Uh, and, and, uh, and we're committed to doing it, uh, no matter where the storyline is. Uh, and the 250th will be yet another example to be able to tell those types of stories of what were the Native American, clearly many Native American contributions to the founding of our country, yet in the historical text, you don't hear much. I remember, uh, and gets to this point too, sitting in the parlor of the McLean House as chief ranger and asking myself, what role did my Latino ancestors play in the Civil War? There's very little in the historic text. It wasn't until I became regional director that I commissioned books on women in the Civil War, Asians in the Civil War, Native American Civil War and Latinos. I found out that 20,000 of my ancestors were engaged in the Civil War. 20,000, that Latinos in Louisiana owned slaves, owned plantations, had no clue. Uh, the story, and, and I would encourage you on the Native American side, is to uh, uh, look up uh, Colonel Eli Parker, and, and Brent and, and Bill will know what I'm talking about. When Robert E. Lee walked into the parlor of McLean House to surrender, he noticed Colonel Eli Parker that was a Native American chief he was General Grant's aide de camp. He drafted the surrender terms. And, and General Lee pointed out to him that it's good to see a true American in the room. And Colonel Eli Parker replied, General, we are all Americans. How many Native Americans, because I didn't know that, knew that one of their ancestors was an eyewitness to history and was in the room? Well, we need to, in our history, to that question, find out who was in the room. 
What did they do? How did they respond? Uh, what's their history and story? We have that opportunity to do that together. We'll have uh, two or three more questions and we'll wrap up. I'm sensitive to your time, David, but um, Olivia asks, uh, does any of your funding go to combating climate change or educating the public regarding this issue? Yeah, we, we do have, uh, you know, uh, programs uh, at, here at headquarters and in the regional office, uh, scientists that do focus uh, on this. Uh, uh, it is an extremely important um, topic of, of consideration. I'll give you an example. Uh, in our coastal parks due to rising sea levels, what we're starting to see are our cultural and archeological assets uh, starting to be impacted uh, by rising sea levels. We're asking ourselves, what will the Everglades look like in the next 50 years through rising sea levels? And when that brackish, brackish water hits the river of grass, just as we're asking ourselves, what is the impact of pythons in the Everglades? And I just signed off on a briefing statement on that it, an exotic species that is having a devastating impact in the Everglades right now and how we're looking at how we can mitigate impacts of exotic species. But that's, that's an example. Climate change is clearly part of that narrative of, uh, you know, what are our coastal parks going to look like? Uh, do we, you know, we're spending millions of dollars based on recent hurricane uh, damages in the Caribbean. Uh, we lost a lot of buildings at Cape Hatteras when a Cat 5 hit it. Do we rebuild? How do we rebuild? Where do we rebuild? And, and some will argue, well, it may, not, may or may not be related to climate change. It doesn't matter to me. The fact is, I have more storms, higher frequency, and greater impact. For me, it's how do we mitigate? How do we prepare? Uh, because it's not only a life and safety issue, uh, clearly a financial issue uh, if we don't get it right. And all this is related to that conversation. Uh, with, uh, with legislation pending to expand funding uh, for parks, uh, you know, I know National Park Service has a $3 billion budget, but, but I also know there are issues with deferred maintenance and sure. we always use more um, and to uh, expand the workforce. Uh, you know, how would you, um, how would you um, uh, allocate those funds if, um, if that were to pass? Yeah, no, I, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, the bipartisan support that we get from Congress. I really do. Uh, and uh, it's important. Uh, we work with members on the Senate and House side all the time. Uh, but if, if our physical plant bill passes and it passes the Senate and we're hopeful in the House, it will provide, the Outdoor uh, Act will provide uh, a significant amount of funding to address our physical plant interests uh, for a second century of service. You know, our aging infrastructure from roads to bridges uh, to facilities um, are clearly evident. And, uh, and so we're very close and all credit to Congress uh, in helping us to get over the finish line. And when that does, we'll be prepared and we'll give the taxpayer another return on their investment. Here's a good question to, uh, to wrap things up uh, from two different students, uh, from um, Janani and Sebastian. Uh, you know, first part is how can we as high school students become more involved with our national parks? And what advice would you give to, to us, uh, uh, those of us who would want to pursue, pursue a career with National Park Service? That's a great question, questions to, to, to end on. Uh, so here are a couple of things. Here's, if you take away anything from this conversation, here it is. I need you. The National Park Service needs to build the next generation of conservation stewards uh, and workforce. And you may remember what I said earlier about how I started in the Youth Conservation Corps. Some of you, I'm sure, live by a, a nearby national park unit. You may live by a nearby state park. N volunteer experience, even as a high school student, counts as paid experience. 
But what it also demonstrates is your commitment to want to learn and build your own network. And that's what's important. Because that volunteer experience as you go into college may land you a seasonal park ranger job, which when you graduate taking advantage of hiring authorities may land you a permanent job as well. And so what you're building is you're building that body of work and you're building that network of support. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is, is that we need to learn from you as to what does a second century visitor experience look like? I can tell you I had a, a 30 minute briefing today on, on technology and how technology can help it influence the visitor experience. That this is becoming the National Park Ranger by many of you. So we need to own that. And we need to make sure that this device is not the same as talking to a, a United States Park Ranger but it will help to answer many of your questions of what you can do and see in a national park. So we can learn from you as to how can we do better from a technology perspective and from an engagement perspective. So remember, we need you. I've lived uh, my life uh, in the national parks, raising two kids. Now I have a second generation. Later. I got six grandkids. Who knows? Maybe we'll have a third. But let me end by saying that thank you for being a part of this program. And to your, your sponsors and leaders, Brent and Bill, uh, hats off to you, my friends. You're doing amazing work because you're building the next generation today. And thank you for what you're doing. Well, David, we are honored to have you as part of our speaker series. This is a, an absolute highlight for, for all of us. And uh, we greatly appreciate your you're speaking with all of our students to, to our Facebook audience. Uh, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, uh, tomorrow night we have uh, Dr. Gretchen Sorum, the author of Driving While Black. Um, and she also has a PBS documentary that's coming out with Rick Burns. Uh, Wednesday night we have Elijah Hayward, uh, who's um, building the International African American Museum in Charleston, South uh, Carolina. Uh, coming up over the next couple of weeks, we've got um, Spencer Crew, the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, uh, the Honorable Tom Ridge, our first U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security. We've we've got a great speaker series coming up. So, uh, but uh, but David, this this I, I don't think we're going to have a better. Uh, I, I won't tell this to any of the other speakers, but this might be the highlight. <laughs> so, I really appreciate it. But you know, thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. And good luck to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.